Namaskar. Welcome Namaskar. to the Namaskar. Welcome to the first online Kashmir festival organized by Global Kashmiri Pandit Diaspora in association with I am Buddha. I want to first welcome our distinguished speaker and preceptor, Dr. Bharat Gupta, to the stage. Namaskar, Dr. Gupta. So happy, so happy to have you here with us. If I may, I'll take a minute to introduce you, not that you need any introduction, to our global audience. Dr. Bharat Gupta, a former associate professor in English at the University of Delhi, is an Indian classicist, theater theorist, sitar and surbahar player, musicologist, cultural analyst, and a newspaper columnist. Presently, he is a trustee and executive member at Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts, IGNCA, New Delhi, Ministry of Culture, Government of India. He is the author of several seminal books, Dramatic Concepts, Greek and Indian, which I personally found fascinating, Natya Shastra Chapter 8, and other seminal works. I have to be honest, Dr. Gupt, that I think of you, and maybe I should say the reverse way, as our Leonardo da Vinci, our Renaissance figure, given the breadth and scope of your contributions to our civilization. So today, uh, Bharaji, uh, I would like you to give us a talk, and then I'll have a few questions, on the subject of keeping the Natya Shastra alive, the Kashmiri tradition. Namaskar. Yes, Tanmayad Hiday Sam Vadanakramena Drachitra Shakti Ganabhumi Vibhag Bhagi Arshol Lasa Parvikar Jushah Karoti Vande Tamam Tamahamindu Kalab Tamsa. So I begin with this uh, prayer which Abhinav Gupta has given at the very outset of his great commentary Abhinav Bharati to Shiva. And with that Mangala Charan, I come to the subject that is keeping Natya Shastra alive and in particular uh, in the Kashmir tradition. Now, you see the Natya Shastra is one of the seminal texts of uh, Indian knowledge system, if one may call it. Uh, it's a popular term these days. Uh, we can, in older language, call it Shastra Parampara or Vidya Parampara or Vangmay. Today, in English, we use this uh, appellation, uh, you know, the system of knowledge. So, Natya Shastra is one of our seminal texts because it has been the foregrounding of a cardinal principle of life in the Indian tradition. And that is that the knowledge of the Vedic tradition and Vedic doesn't mean just the Samhitas and the texts or the mantras of the uh, Samhitas, but all that flows the so-called Vedamat, Upanishad and downwards. All that knowledge of the Vedamat is brought to the common man through performance, through Natya. Now, this is a very prominent feature of our culture, something very specific, and that's why it was called Pancham Ved. And uh, the ability to bring the deepest of the ideas to the simplest of the folks, 
to the simplest of the people. So Natya Shastra is therefore a seminal text, not only a seminal text, but also a habit of culture. This is how culture in India thrived. And it was one of the devices of preserving and uh, disseminating the culture. Now, I would say that we have to see the Kashmir contribution within the context of the All India activity regarding Natya Shastra. Because Natya Shastra, uh, as it is obtained by us now, as it uh, comes to us, and technically it is called uh, Shat Sahasri, that is having 6,000 verses attributed to Bharat Muni, the great compiler. Now, this has been performed all over India, and it was an all India text. The proof of that is not in the history of it as to who wrote it and where did it travel from where to where and what was the line of teachers, etc. The proof of it is in the art itself, because it was an all India art. When Natya Shah says that, look, as it says in the 17th chapter, that there are going to be uh, seven or eight languages which would be <laughs> included in theater. It is a multilingual theater. You know, all other theaters of the world have been unilingual. The great Greek theater tradition was uh, centered around uh, Athens, you know, Attica, the area single language more or less. But here we have uh, 10 or 20 or 5 or 7, uh, just according to the audience, a large, it was a, always and always a multilingual tradition. And it's only in the 19th century that India came to cease unilingual theater. So it was an all India tradition. And the lives and the speech, the Vani, the Vak, of people from different parts of India was reflected in it. And uh, I am never tired of saying, although Sanskrit scholars are uh, always angry with me for saying this, that it was not Sanskrit theater. Sanskrit was only 5-10% of it. The rest was all Prakrit. All music was in Prakrit. And there were many Prakrits in it. So it was an all India tradition. It was a multilingual tradition. And it constantly drew from all parts of India. It uh, drew from all kinds of art forms that evolved with different kinds of art forms over a period of time. Now, Given this reality, there are still attempts to locate uh, Bharat Muni. People say, well, uh, Bharat Muni, where did he belong? <laughs> was he a Punjabi? Was he a Bengali? Was he a Kashmiri? Uh, there are many attempts to that. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, whichever way you look at it, uh, there is very little reliable evidence to say that he belonged to this particular region of India. Because number one, he never talks about his ethnicity or even the ethnicities of, of his disciples, his hundred disciples, nor do they refer to a particular region as more important than other regions. So they talk about the growth of various uh, kinds of arts in various regions. The languages from all over India, but uh, there were certain art forms that came from very specifically certain areas of India, like music. As we all know, music in ancient times was called Gandharva. And Gandhar certainly belonged to Afghanistan, where there is no music now. 
and the Gandharvas belong to Afghanistan or that region. And these Gandharvas were the ones who invented Samgan or they, the earliest singers of Samgan are Gandharvas. So it's very clear that this belonged to a region which is Afghanistan, present day uh, Kandhar or Gandhar or Gandhar. That much we know. However, Gandharva has an all India application. And texts of music or texts not even of music or musicology, but uh, literary texts were referring to music, the science of music as Gandharva, even if they were composed, let's say, somewhere in the south. So the Saundarya Lahiri, even if we believe it was not composed by the great Shankaracharya himself, but one of his disciples, was certainly composed somewhere in the south of India. It refers to the science of music as Gandharva. So in 7th, 8th or 9th century, whatever date you want to fix for that text, uh, that text was referring to music as Gandharva. The point I'm trying to highlight is that things were taken from different parts of India and made into all India. All India, not in the sense that they lost their local flavor, but all India in the sense that they became popular, applied, used, and people started liking them and using them from all over India. So when you see this particular aspect of uh, Natya Shastra, then it is very clear that Natya Shastra belonged to the whole of India. And it is in the context of this that we have to see that we have to see what is the contribution of Kashmir and where does the contribution begin and also what is the evidence for that contribution you know what is the historical uh, evidence for that contribution now if Bharat Muni cannot be located if Bharat Muni cannot be pinned down, let me say, pinned down to one region of India, then we have to see what are the intellectual traditions that he follows. Uh, although there is a single text today which goes by the name of Bharat Muni or Muni as its compiler of Praneta or uh, as the text says apta purusha that is the that is the uh, the person who compiled or established the tradition yet we know for sure that this bharat is a later bharat mm. the tradition very specifically mentioned that there was a vritta bharat in other words, Bharat is not specifically an individual alone, but it is a line of great teachers or the preservers of the Shastra. So those who preserved, composed, realigned, enlarged, edited, the uh, tradition or the Shastra of Natya called the Natya Shastra were Bharat. Because then you had a Vridha Bharat and maybe there was obviously an old elder to him, etc, etc. So Bharat Muni therefore is in himself more or less a composite or an all India phenomenon. Then it is also said that Bharat Muni himself took two major traditions, the tradition of Brahma and the tradition of Shiva. The very first line, Pranamya Shirsa Devo, uh, Pranamya Shirsa Devo, Pitamaha, 
Pitam, uh, I forget the exact line. It refers to Shiva and to uh, uh, into and to uh, to Brahma. So it is said that there were two lines. One was of Brahma and another of Shiva. And in the Natyotpatti section, we also see that the initial creation of Natya is attributed to Brahma and then its great expansion and embellishment through uh, dance, which eventually led to Murti Puja or formation of the icon. I have just finished a paper on it and I have a few videos now on the internet explaining that from Natya Shastra was of the Shaiva tradition. So this is a tradition which in itself draws from many sources. Now, Natya Shastra being uh, largely a Shaiva tradition, therefore acquires a very specific function in the land of Kashmir. Because the Kashmir Shaivism was the seat of one great Shaiv tradition. And it was acknowledged <coughs> uh, by rest of India as, uh, as the apex of Shaiv tradition. And Abhinav Gupta was uh, called Kanteshavatara and Shiva himself who had come to Kashmir Desha. You see his disciple Madhuraj Yogin says that very clearly that the whole of country acknowledged him as Sakshat Shiva. So this uh, significance of the Shaiva thought right from its earlier inception to its preservation makes a significant uh, marker to the contributions of Kashmir. Now, when we come to specific evidence as to how the Kashmiri scholars or the tradition contributed to Natya Shastra, then we begin with the line of Abhinav Gupta. Now, it is very well known that uh, it was around the 7th century, 7th, 8th century, that Atri Gupta was brought from Madhya Desh. Now, where exactly from Madhya Desh, uh, there can be a debate, uh, but he came from Madhya Desh. And he was patronized, uh, I think it was Lalita Aditya who brought him over. And he came and uh, was given uh, to uh, form his ashram in Srinagar. Now, it is from this place that the major tradition of the family of Abhinav Gupta begins. But at the same time, there was already a great Shaiva tradition. And scholars were studying Natya Shastra. Now, we know about those scholars only from Abhinav Bharati. <clears throat> the original texts of uh, Bhattalolat, uh, Shankoka, and Nayak, uh, they don't exist today. Uh, maybe if uh, we Indians wake up and start, uh, you know, dusting hundreds and thousands of the manuscripts that are still lying in our <laughs> libraries, then maybe we'll discover uh, the original text of Bhattanayak or Lollat or Shankuk or many more whose names we don't even know for sure. And, and many, of course, the names that we know through the commentary of Abhinav Gupta. So <clears throat> this was the great scholarly tradition which developed in Kashmir. Now, many people have started this canard that the tradition of commentary started in Kashmir after 
the actual performances of theater had declined. That people started uh, writing about Natya Shastra, making commentaries, detailed commentaries about Natya Shastra. When the practice of theater, the, the practice of the art had declined. Now, this is not true. As a matter of fact, the tradition of writing commentary in India has always been to embellish a particular Shastra in terms of what is happening there and then in that field. So the commentator studies what is going on. All the commentators like Bhattanayak, etc., they must have been watching theater. And they must have been watching theater more closely. They and they were not just Rasikas. That is, they just said wah 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 wah. They were not so simply that kind of people. They were people who knew about the finest detail. They were associated with the Acharyas. They were the people who were consulted by the practical performers. Those who practiced the art. So there was a total symbiosis between the commentary writer and the actual nutter or the performer or the maha nutter. They were all doing these things together, learning from each other. How do we know about that? When I make such an assertion, do I have any evidence? The evidence is again Abhinav Bharati. Uh, for instance, if you see the fourth chapter of Abhinav Bharati, which is on Karanas and Angaharas, etc., and uh, which talks about the question of what is a nritta and how it is different from Natya. Then in that theoretical discussion, Abhinav Gupta takes up the example of certain living forms which he was seeing in his times. And these living forms uh, are not quote, quote unquote classical forms. They are not performance of Karanas and Angaharas. They are something very popular called Dombika. So there was an art form at that time called Dombika. And it seems that Dombika, Dome, performers of Dome were all India. Again, they were not restricted to Kashmir. Uh, many people think that uh, uh, thousands of them had to migrate due to certain historical conditions into Europe. And they are the ancestors of the people called Rome or Romani or Gypsies. So, Abhinav Gupta saw that Dombika, particular art form, and he gives example like this is what's happening here. This is what we see on the stage now. And he illustrates the difference between Natya and Nritya through the example of Dombika. I am trying to establish that all these commentaries were based upon an acute observation of the art form. Of course, Abhinav was a musician. Uh, he played the Veena. Uh, what kind of Veena he played, we don't know because uh, it's just called Nad Veena. That by, by his left hand, he is just strumming the La Nad Veena, probably just uh, listening to the background sound while he is dictating commentaries to his disciple. Uh, this is what we know from his uh, pen portrait by Madhuraji Yogin, Draksha Ramasya Madhya, etc. You know that famous portrait. So Abhinav knew the art forms and so did his previous commentators like Bhattanaya, uh, Shankoka, Lol Lata, and various others. These are the three uh, most prominent ones. And uh, we have to understand that. 
this point has to be uh, substantiated by another evidence and that's the evidence that I uh, want to give that this is the philosophic background that I want to talk about, something which you also indicated. You see, the Shaiva tradition of Kashmir is a Rasik tradition. It is not like uh, the so-called purely ascetic Vitaragi tradition in which the diversity of Rasas in which the uh, enjoyment of the senses is put aside in order to seek the higher moksha or uh, higher forms of uh, realization. It is something which is based and rooted in this world. There is a, it's not a doctrine of Maya that predominates there. No. So, now if this world is not only real, but it is also a world full of rasa, then practice of every kind of art is crucial. It is through the senses that you transcend the senses. If one may put it uh, simply, perhaps I am oversimplifying. <laughs> to the horror of uh, great philosophers, I am perhaps oversimplifying, but more or less it is that. It is, uh, it has a parallel to the Pushti mark, but then it is much deeper than the Pushti mark. And I would say it is the crux of Hinduism, because in the worship of the Nirguna, in reaching the Nirguna, it is constantly entwined with the Saguna. So, this is an experience which is found in Pratimhigya, which is found in Trika, which is found in various other sects of uh, the Shaivism which they practiced. And practice of Natya, which is a total art. Natya is not just music, it is not just poetry, it is not just a painting, it is not just sculpture, it is not just dance, it is everything. Therefore, Natya is more significant than any other art form. It is the total art form and therefore it is most valuable as part of sadhana and sadhana of the Shaiva tradition. You see, that's why the great commentaries were written in order to correlate the philosophical uh, theorization in the realm of uh, pure philosophy with art. Now this is the specific contribution of the Kashmiri tradition, but sustaining that behind the scenes to my mind, is the tradition of Natya. And uh, this whole tradition uh, is personified in the best manner in the, uh, in the charitra or in the personality of Abhinav Gupta. Now, it is true that uh, it is not only Abhinav Gupta who was so deeply associated with Natya. The whole people were. Because Natya or theater is not something which uh, only a section of society can do. You see, it is not an art form like poetry, which can be patronized by, let's say, a few people. Or it is not like uh, so called classical music that it can be patronized by a small class and still preserved. You know, like in the 19th century, uh, the rich uh, zamidars of Bengal, they, they heavily patronized the classical music. 
uh, and they produce great artists there. So it was a small section of people who preserved. Now, you cannot preserve theater that way. Theater has to be preserved by society as a whole, by people as a whole. The rich, the poor, the middle class, everybody has to go to theater. And when they go to theater, then theater flourishes. Then theater has that great diversity. Now, this was being practiced in Kashmir, certainly. Uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, Rakesh ji, you sent me quotations from Jonah Raja's uh, Raja Tarangini. And uh, those quotations describe something uh, which is almost 400 years after Abhinavgupta. Now, if that survived 400 years after Abhinavgupta and in a period of decline, that is when Islam had virtually taken over uh, Kashmir, and we know that theater uh, is technically haram in uh, Islam, but it was still continuing there. And it was still continuing in a very strong way. Uh, you do not uh, find any example of that kind of a social description of social activity, let us say around New Delhi, uh, Delhi, in the Delhi Sultanate, or in Madhya Pradesh, or in Gujarat. So, the tradition of theatre was so strong in Kashmir, among the people, that it faced the greatest of adversity, and survived as long as it could. That's what I want to say. Now, the contributions of the great commentators, uh, they were very quickly taken up by the rest of India. Uh, we know that uh, Madhuraj Yogin came all the way from South India and became a disciple of uh, Abhinav Gopal. And uh, in his own lifetime, the Shaiva world of India acknowledged him as Kantesh Avatar, the incarnation of Shiva himself. So his books had traveled to the whole of India. And uh, they were, of course, in medieval times available to scholars and among the scholarly Pandit tradition uh, of Sanskrit scholars. But uh, the major manuscript resurfaced for the first time late 19th century, early 20th century in Kerala. So they traveled to Kerala very quickly, soon after he had written his Abhinav Bharati. And they must have been in circulation at the time. We have discovered uh, uh, manuscripts in Nepal also, and IGNC has brought out uh, uh, editions of that recently. The uh, contributions of the Kashmir commentators was taken up by India very quickly. Now, in Kashmir, it seems, some kind of urban performance uh, remained as the evidence you gave. This urban performance disappeared in uh, almost the whole of India. You see, with the advent of Islam, there was very little Natya in the city. Natya shifted to the countryside. It shifted to uh, different ashramas. It shifted to certain Vaishnav sthanas. It shifted to uh, all kinds of uh, all kinds of Vaishnav traditions and Krishna Bhakti traditions and the Ram Bhakti traditions also into far off temples that uh, survived the. Uh, a destruction unleashed by Islamic forces. It survived only there, not in the city. 
And therefore, the dramatic tradition, the tradition of writing plays, was no longer a living tradition in the sense that nobody wrote plays to be performed. Pandits used to write plays as an exercise, and they were writing uh, plays uh, as panditri or as uh, literary activity, particularly prahasanas till 50 years ago, you know, pandits used to sit down and write <coughs> prahasana as an art form, but not as a text to be given to the nutter to perform in town, because that theatre disappeared. So the whole urban theatre of India had its last appearance in Kashmir only. <laughs> It's around 15th, 16th century, as the evidence you sent me shows. This is the last time when you have urban theater and people of the urban uh, uh, origin going to far off places to celebrate uh, festivals. So there is a connection between the town and the temple, between the sacred places and the areas of performance. Now, this does not exist in the rest of India, except in very small pockets and certain temple complexes. And there the nature of theatre changes. What we have is temple dances. What we have is uh, Natya theatre more relevant to the ashram, more relevant to Krishna Bhakti, Rama Bhakti, or to the Archana Puja of a given temple but not uh, a theatre which was uh, based on, not a theatre which was based upon uh, worldly stories. The theatre was based only on godly stories. So I think Kashmir made a seminal contribution. It's most memorable. Uh, it's something the rest of India will always and always be grateful to it. Thank you. Most remarkable. And uh, Bharatji, this whole Kashmir festival is about Kashmir's Pratibha and Yogdan. And you have, uh, in a very short time, done an extraordinary job of introducing us to it. Can I ask you a few questions we can explore a little bit more? My pleasure, sir. My pleasure. Okay. Okay. The first one, as I was listening to the very beginning, you mentioned that in the text, uh, there is no location, there's no description of identity, what is the possibility that this was a traveling troupe of actors, that this troupe of 100 sons actually traveled, not just was in uh, Afghanistan or Kashmir or whatever, but traveled? Because, I mean, at the end of the day, this seems to have been a very vast enterprise. And one would presume they would go from city to city, and that may have been the reason why it became Pan-India with the multiple languages. Well, that is it. That is it. It was being performed and professional actors and actresses, because in Indian theater, women are made to perform right from the start. And Natyashas provides the evidence that when they tried to perform with men only, it was a miserable failure. And God told them, don't be stupid now. Please bring in the women. Yes. So. The performers performed all over India, yeah. but then those who were studious, those who recorded their performances, those who made Shastras out of their performance. You see, because Shastra is Shasano Upaya. Yeah. It, is, it is an Upaya to provide a discipline. So then they were thinkers about. Sure. Now, these thinkers were located in certain places, 
but they were also exchanging notes across india they were writing commentaries um, editing texts uh, making formulations and passing them on to other corners of india so uh, from the very earliest time the evidence shows that scholarship traveled just as performers traveled sure sure So talking about travel we've talked a lot about India but I want to take you back to your PhD <laughs> all right uh, which clearly in retrospect was sort of you debuting your prowess and an early indicator of your genius where you did this PhD on poetics of Aristotle and Bharata's Natya Shastra, and when you date Aristotle and you date Bharata and you date Alexander's in with invasion, and you look at Gandhara. what is the possibility that there was some osmosis some exchange so that this rigid idea that something is you know locked in as greek or locked in as indian that maybe during that time uh provenance may have had some importance but flow could also have been a contributor what are your thoughts as you look at your phd see when when i started my uh, i wouldn't say phd because my phd came almost uh, almost 25 years after my exploration of the subject oh okay you see i had started exploring this thing uh, in 1970 and my phd was uh, written in 91 20 years later i took wow. 20 years to explore to see to learn language to learn greek ancient greek and of course sanskrit i had and and to see the sources and to go really deep into it but the driving force was this the idea when you see when i saw the performing traditions of india and when i read about because i had not been to greece in 70s when i read about the performance of greek plays then i said look what they tell me from london and new york and all this british scholarship or german this is not talking about actual performance they are talking about written plays which they are reading from the greek side and from the indian side so i was studying the natya shastra and i was studying the actual performing traditions of greece simultaneously hmm. from 1970 71 onwards i started doing that natya shast gave me a clear deep analysis of what was the indian performance and then various other sources uh books written on how plays were actually performed you know very at at that time famous works like picard cambridge and eagle town and various others uh, back in uh, 1920 and 1950 onwards the performance showed me that the real thing is in performance and what is presented as greek theater is only an imagination of the europeans about greek theater hmm. you see the truth of the matter is that the christians they eliminated greek theater because they said this is ungodly so greek theater was put to death it was revived i mean it survived as morality plays and small christian plays but it was revived in europe much later on 
in uh, around 50 uh, ar around uh, almost uh, you know uh, yes, around uh, with christopher marlowe and shakespeare and all the, these great writers and then they read aristotle and they took certain things out of it only they left out all the music they left out all the gesture they left out all the dance they left out all the chorus because these things cannot be recreated by just reading a manual or a book you have to have a living tradition of it so they created a theater it was great it was wonderful we hats off to all these great writers like shakespeare and racine and all that but this was European theater. Imagined and Greek theater was imagined by them as what they were practicing. Then they brought this whole thing to India in the 19th century. And we started having an imitation of European theater. And what came into existence was Bengali theater, Marathi theater, Tamil theater, Hindi theater not the tradition of Natya Shastra, not the multilingual theater, not the theater full of dance, music, gesture, symbolic language, not the theater full of rasa, but theater full of argument. So when I saw all this, I said, let me go deep into it. And this is how my book was born. Then the question arises, what is the origin? Did the Greeks influence us? Did we influence the Greeks? Now, this question is actually a political question. Oh. Because when the British came, the Europeans, they thought classical means something which follows the Greek model. So they said, do you have something classical? People say, yes, we have Kalidas. And they said, OK, this is classical. Then they imagined the performance of Kalidas just as they would imagine the performance of Shakespeare. And so Kalidas was performed in Bengali stage as Shakespeare was performed the night before. And that urban theater developed. Now, I was deeply troubled by all this because I had a knowledge of uh, theater. I had done some practical theater also in my college and uh, later on early days. I had been a small actor, sort of. I was trained as a musician for 10 years under Pandit Umashankar Mishra. So I had a direct knowledge of an Indian art. And I said, no, something is missing. Then my book was born. And I could see that these are two great traditions which developed independently. They may have had a common Indo-European uh, ancestor somewhere in the past. You know, somewhere like uh, hey, in 1800 BC or 2000 BC, something, you know, but that's that's not a concern. What is important is that the Greek vision and the Indian vision had something highly common. The way they approach music, the way they approach poetry, the way they approach dance and how they made it into a single unity and how they performed it. So oh. I wanted to show that consonance. And I wrote my book on that. Lovely. And so I showed that how uh, the great tragedians in Athena, they developed from the Homeric tradition. And if you read Homer, then you can see that he is an ancestor of... Uh, Ischylus and Euripides and all this. Similarly, if you read uh, the Upanishadic, the, the Vedic text, and the text of Natishas, then you see how that tradition is developing. It has certain common features, philosophic ideas, but in practical art, it is something entirely different. I tried to search for certain historical evidences if was uh, the text of uh, Aristotle ever translated into Sanskrit, <laughs> say in the Bactrian times or in 150 BC with the uh, Greeks occupying certain parts of northern India, but nothing of that sort is available. So I stuck to what is available 
uh, in terms of hard evidence and I didn't find any. So I rested my case by showing the similarities and of course the many differences. Like we don't use the mask and there are various reasons and we have a different kind of theater house and they don't, they have amphitheaters. So all these differences are there and all these similarities are there. And I made a category of what I called aeropraxis, sacred action. In Greek, uh, I named it as aeropraxis, sacred aeropraxis. action. That this is the theater of sacred action in which man communicates with gods. And they are theaters of incarnation. Both so let me let me pick up on that. Uh, yeah. uh, Shastra, Brahma is invoked. Uh, you've used the word imagination. You've used the word incarnation. Uh, at the very start of the Natya, you know, uh, there's a sacralization of the stage. And uh, as uh, uh, Kapila Watson says, uh, one interpretation of that is that uh, it's uh, creating the armor for the body, the body being the stage, and protecting the imagination of the performers because that's their creativity that's going to be put on display. Now, uh, you know, uh, in Kashmir, Abhinav Gupta and others spent a lot of time, uh, actually this all came about between the debates between the Shavites and the Buddhists regarding the role of Smriti Shakti, Kalpana Shakti, memory and, imagina memory and imagination. And in fact, one of the things that fascinates me about uh, uh, Abhinav Gupt in that area, is that he says Smriti has a rasa to it. So he ascribes rasa even to Smriti Shakti. So I am curious, when you look at Kashmir and you look at Natya Shastra, imagination, how was it seen? Because clearly nowadays, especially the young, we all recognize that creativity, creative Shakti is crucial to innovation and to your success going forward. So any thoughts on the message yes. of Natya Shastra? Yes, Natya Shastra is the first evidence of how Murti Puja began. The transition from the Vedic Yajna and the songs that were being sung along with Vedic Yajna, the music played on Veena, the songs of Dhruva Gaan, etc., which were all being done out of that very practical thing as theater developed there came the worship of god as sakar and you have very clear evidence of this in the fourth chapter because shiva teaches through tandu shiva teaches Brahm, uh, bharata muni the angaharas karana's angaharas and he also teaches him Pindi Bandhas. Now, what is, what is Pindi Bandha? Pindi Bandha is that in this pind, in this body, I am binding, I am bringing down all the characteristics of a deity, of a Devata. The Devata may be Shiv, the Devata may be Indra, the Devata may be Brahma. So, when I take their roop into my body. When I show their ayud, like Vajra of Indra, when I show their vahan, you know, the vahan of a particular god, like Vishnu is riding on Garuna. So when I show all these characteristics of a devata in my body on the stage, then that is called Pindi Bandha. Hmm. Now, this was part of the instruction and education or dance which was given by Tandu at the instance of Shiva to Bharat Muni. Mm -hmm. And it was performed there in the Dhruva Gans. So here you have an evidence of the Vedic gods who were earlier given only Vak Puja who were pleased by mantras and given the 
the ahutis that now you also give them a shape on the stage and once they come on the stage they protect it they protect it yeah. so, so very quickly very quickly uh, because we only have 3 minutes more moving right. on to shiva uh, and shiva thought what can you guide us because both in natya shastra and shiva philosophy there seems to be this inter uh, penetration around the notion of chamatkar and jivan mukti that both are sort of you know complementary pathways any any thoughts that you can drive so, us deeper this is this is well established uh, because uh, rasa is called chamatkar by all the four great uh, commentators bhattalolat and uh, uh, shankok nayak and abhinav and they all describe this chamatkar in different ways but they but they go for this chamatkar and similarly the whole idea of samvit the whole idea of the shaiv realization of the ultimate is a chamatkar yeah yeah so art leads you to that chamatkar in the higher realm having made an experience for you in the ordinary realm of existence so the kashmir philosophers are very very clear about this whole thing well uh, i have to say that your talk today bharat ji if there's one rasa i am left with it is the adbhut rasa you have been simply you have created magic with what you have shared with us uh, thank you so much and dhanyawad and we look forward to learning more from you as we progress together i i'm grateful to you all for giving me this opportunity i have just regurgitated what i have learned from some of my gurus <laughs> it's nothing original i i hope that those who have listened would uh, take this this whole investigation even further and further and climb higher and higher sopanavat as abhinav gupt said <laughs> yeah thank you thank you thank you very much Thank you.